Well, we effectively prove this in our domestic dogs. Practically, you should think of the person who raises dogs in kennels, like the Afghan hound, that's not sold until it's about six months of age. Many of those are absolute screwballs when they emerge from relative, not social, but sensory deprivation. The same holds true from a lot of dogs that come from puppy palaces, too. They're kept in these beautiful sterile cages, you've seen them. These freaky guys walking in white coats, you know, almost with surgical gloves on, Dr. Kildare trip or whatever the demon vet is. And <clears throat> these animals have lots of human contact, but they're never taken out of those cages in most of the places. If they are, it's into a little playpen in which a pig wouldn't even be happy. It's so small. They have no varied stimulation. I'd be very afraid of taking one of those dogs, especially if it was a little on the timid side, a little sensitive. It could really flip out. Next slide. This is the kind of EEG thing that we see in an animal emerging from isolation. A normal EEG, EEG emerging from isolation, had these extraordinary little spindle bursts. These are not much larger, actually, but deep electrodes. And they gradually disappear. A very similar thing has been described by a couple of researchers in Oxford with autistic children. A very low amplitude, fast frequency EEG, almost flat, it's so aroused. And here we find these abnormal spindle-like bursts. They're tied in with the animal's incredible hyper-exploratoriness. As the animal cools out slowly, these abnormal waves disappear. Next slide. With more extended isolation, you really finish up with a screwball. John Fuller worked with these beagles in Bar Harbor. They have stereotype behaviors, pacing and whirling like dervishes. This is one who's been in isolation for the first six months, totally withdrawn compared to control. He found, uh, Melzack in Canada found that you could stick needles right through their skin and they would show no pain response. Light a candle and they'd be curious and just keep putting their noses into the candle. <clears throat> he thought that this was because they had not experienced pain when in isolation. But we now know that when you're super aroused and you cut yourself, you feel no pain. That these animals are so aroused, like an autistic child that puts its hand on top of the cooking stove and watches it burn that high arousal can block, can be a gate to block pain. So some of these animals that are produced this way are very bizarre. Practical implications again, we have certain genotypes which are extremely spooky, very timid animals, very timid dogs from inbred lines and so on. And these grow up very much like this. You've seen some of them yourselves. You get them on the table somehow and they just kind of freeze there and you can do almost anything to them. I'm sure you could almost do surgery on them. You shouldn't, of course. Literally the catatonic dog. We have a lot of small dogs that are hyperkinetic too, somewhat like the hyperkinetic child. Be nice to experiment. We know in the hyperkinetic child that you have to give dexedrine. You have to give a stimulant to stimulate the inhibitory centers and then the child relaxes. Probably these dogs would do quite well on those drugs too. Or perhaps we should practice more rigorous eugenics because we can't do that with human beings. Next slide. Under stimulation, for a dog that's raised normally, under stimulation can literally kill it. Having been used to a certain set point of stimulation, and then it's suddenly withdrawn, he goes to the boarding kennel, he can develop stereotype behaviors, he can begin self-mutilating. This is a German shepherd. It was boarded for no, no reason except the owners were going away at the Spire Hospital in New York. Nothing wrong with his skin or anything. He got bored, he started to groom. Eventually began to mutilate his stifle region. Animals in zoos will do this too, mutilating themselves to the point of evisceration. Terrible. Other animals, don't forget the other side of this coin, that the animal coming into your hospital for boarding can get extremely depressed because of the emotional separation from the owners. It'll develop anorexia nervosa, or even a hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, all kinds of bizarre things. But worse still, he might not show anything. And you carry on and you do your surgery. On this animal, it's being stressed emotionally because he's deprived of his parents, because he's been raised on a total suck symbiotic situation. He's in a strange place. Think of these stresses interacting with your surgery that you're performing. That's one big mountain for you to climb. Siamese cats, some of you might as well give up anyway, because they'll die by the time you've anesthetized them. Then you have to pay for all your cages and your rubber plants and so on. So you have a bit of 
a ripoff by keeping the animals hospitalized for a couple of weeks. Many vets now have told me that they don't do any of that at all now. They get the animals home as soon as possible because the payoff is much better. More animals survive. But the post-operative period for many of our pet dogs is very critical. Talk to a good pediatrician and he'll tell you the same thing for kids. In some of the better hospitals now, there are rooming in facilities for the mothers. Now you might say, well, that's just anthropomorphic, expecting a dog to need mother around. But I'm not. You look at the dogs and then you'll certainly agree. <laughs> Next slide. It's sad, but it's a fact. Well, very briefly, we've been looking at urban dogs this summer in St. Louis. This is something else totally different. Dogs forage, they come out of their homes, they go into the garbage. They adapt, it's remarkable. Next slide. Some of these won't show up too well. One big problem is free roaming dogs, bitch in heat, you have a pack forming, a temporary pack. Sometimes they will attack people, they get a bit ordinary, but it's, it's unusual. An obvious traffic hazard. Next slide. We found a trio, a leader female and two males that lived in two disused houses. This was the pack that I was talking about, a remarkable group that had so little overt communication, they were always kind of together. Here they are foraging backyard, about two in the morning, knocking over trash cans and so on. They're most active between midnight and five. It's about the best time to be up anyway in St. Louis in the summer. Next slide. There should be one there. Yes, this is another reality. Most of the homeless dogs, the trio that we have, don't have homes. Most of the homeless dogs are like this. This one would watch over a four-week period to slowly go downhill. The dog apparently hadn't picked it up. It was dying at this stage. This one is another feral dog, covered in manes. These are two. This one on the left is almost terminal. This is a young pup, and you can see the extent of the manes that he has there. I've seen even worse cases than this. I didn't bring the color slides along because I didn't want to nauseate you. What does all this mean? This is in the city. It's an incredible ecological impact. In the, urb in the rural areas, it is too, where we have feral dog packs forming, going after livestock. Poor coyote gets blamed again. Some of them breed with coyotes, and we have new, new hybrids, like the New Hampshire hybrid, and all these koi dogs all the way, way around the Midwest, coyote dog hybrids. What's the root of this? Basically, human irresponsibility. People have their puppy, it grows up, it's too much of a, a job, a responsibility to, to have this thing, so we let it go. You might have read some of the correspondence about veterinarians getting into the spay business. But I say this because spaying is no longer a cosmetic operation. It used to be. It used to be an inconvenience for your old lady to have this bitch coming into heat every six months. And so you would spay it and charge her accordingly because it's a luxury operation. But now more than ever, this operation has social and ecological implications too. Consider a poor person in the ghetto who has nothing to come home to but two or three dogs. They need those dogs emotionally. They've always had dogs. You can't rip off a hundred bucks from that person for spaying the dog. You might say, well, rationalize, and I've had this in a lot of letters. Well, these people can't afford to keep a dog anyway. They shouldn't be allowed to have a dog. This is nonsense. They manage. They share their own food with those dogs. And there are lots of people like that. This is why we really need spay clinics. This is why it really hurts me, visiting places like Florida, where a couple of young veterinarians will try to set up a spay clinic, and suddenly the local veterinary association says, if you don't stop this, you're not going to practice in our area. Wow, what professionalism do we have? Eww, scary. I'm getting out of breath. Let's change the next slide. <clears throat> Social responsibility. We have to broaden our perceptions of our role in society, not for a carriage trade. We really have great responsibilities in urban and rural areas, in zoos to improve animal health, mental health too. What's going on in the evolution of dogs? Dogs being bred for the show ring, what kind of temperament is there, is there left now? Terriers used to be terriers, really aggressive little beasts. They're not supposed to bite anymore. You've got to breed something more docile but still looks like a terrier. I wonder. Here there's one really good judge at the Westminster Show, this old girl here. She's putting these guys through their paces. 
you seeing how well they threaten each other? I really applauded that. In most dog shows, you can have this stud dog who very soon, his semen is going to be frozen and shipped all over the globe because he's a prize winner. He's a prize because he just looks good. Nobody's given him a real temperament test, a good workout, in terms of stability of handling and so on, which I think is very important. Because the dog is becoming a high, fast commercial item now. Japanese buying them up for 20,000 bucks a piece and more, good studs. A lot of money involved. More responsibility being involved now, too. And here we need applied behavior in the show ring. Next slide. Our dogs are evolving into these new roles, too, with reduced population growth. More and more young people, where it was once old people, are using dogs and cats and things, too, not primarily as child substitutes, but something to come home to, an analogous thing, something to give attention to, an emotional crutch. Like this guy saying here, you certainly held this marriage together, haven't you, boy? Many dogs do. Next slide. Read Boris Levinson. Well, I have said in previous publications that the dog is raised in an environment very similar to the environment in which many children are raised over-permissive or over-indulgent and so on. Similar milieu. So you should not be surprised if a dog will develop certain emotional disorders like asthma, hysterical paraplegia in one leg, urticaria, and so on, comparable to what child psychiatrists see. This is confirmed further by what we know of the dog's brain, that it's very similar to a human being's brain, especially a young human being, age two or three. The main difference is that we have broker speech area and we have a bigger association cortex. Basically, we're the same. The basic being in this limbic system, the center of emotions, the connection to the autonomic nervous system that I was talking about earlier, and the hormones. We have the same neural substrate in dog and child, given the same environment. We should not be surprised. A few years ago, I gave a talk in Des Moines, Iowa. No, I gave a talk somewhere in Iowa, and a veterinarian from Des Moines, Iowa, came up and told me about this, I think it was a Pekingese, that came into the hospital. Both hind legs were paralyzed. He couldn't make a real diagnosis. It seemed asymptomatic. So he said to the owners, well, leave it here, and I'll check it out. And they went home, and within a short while, the dog was up on all fours, wagging his tail. So he called them up, come and get the dog. Something's happened, they don't know. They picked the dog up. Soon after, they came back. The dog had collapsed again. So we dug into the case and found that this dog had been an overindulged child substitute for years. And then suddenly, its mother, the wife, had her own baby. And this was too much for the dog. And they developed a classic conversion hysteria <laughs> in the hind legs. The capacity is there to elaborate all kinds of adaptive attention-seeking behaviors. Cats don't have it evolved quite so far as dogs yet. Cats are less dependent than dogs. So they're less vulnerable. Fritz Perls, a great humanistic psychologist and psychiatrist, says that the root of most human behavior disorders is related to one form of dependency hang-up or another. And with making dogs more dependent, we do make them more prone to develop these disorders. A cat who's ousted by a baby being born is likely to spray somewhere or to crap outside of his litter box. And that's about the extent of his reactions. <laughs> most cats. Some cats will die when the owner dies, just like a dog will. Yeah. Next slide. Before I close, just a couple of slides to get back to this gestalt or holistic view. We've been speaking especially of the organism and its environment. I now want to speak of the system within the organism. We tend to look at things directly. Like we look at the heart for a defect and we don't look around it. A Pavlovian, a Russian physiologist, looks at everything through the top of the patient's or subject's head. He said you can't consider the part because all things are related. Looking at the part might help you. That part might be showing the symptoms, but it might be a clutch and not your carburetor that's wrong. Think of the whole animal here. This is a good illustration. 75% of this particular breed survive total body radiation. When you give them an emotional stress, like making it difficult to make a discrimination between two signals, they're uptight. You then radiate them and only 43% survive. Wow. 
That's quite a variable. The uptightness is caused by a release of ACTH. We know that this reduces phagocytic activity of leukocytes and does all kinds of other things. It lowers immune responses. This animal's resistance is lowered by some prior stress, the emotional stress. Just like you having the animal in your hospital, its resistance is lowered. Don't be surprised. Why do all, all, so many animals get kennel cough and so on? There's secondary complications and heaven knows what else. All kinds of factors operating together. We could even say that no animal, no human being, ever gets a disease, primarily, unless it's extremely virulent. The E. coli's are caused by some other stress in calves, humidity, crowding, or whatever, or transit. We should look for other variables. Our medicine does tend to teach us just to look for one cause instead of the whole. This is why acupuncture has blown so many minds over here in the last couple of years. Next slide. Let's imagine putting a needle in somebody to cure urticaria, and then he suddenly has a tremendous rush of asthma because that was an earlier disease that he had. You get that straight, you're going through the layers, and then suddenly you get that straight, and he starts going down with an infantile-like diarrhea, which he had when he was way back as a baby. Uh, you, you pull all these things out of the somatic memory of the body. <clears throat> That's not in any of our textbooks. It's in the body, all right. Now, these are the three different breeds of dogs that are exposed to this total body radiation. OK, we're all going to get zapped now. Only 30% of you types survive. Tough luck. 85% of these guys survive, and 92% of these. Well, why are these differences? It's not body size because they're given, in fact, the same unit dose. Differences in temperament and the Pavlovian way. Pavlov describes this low survivor as a dog with a weak nervous system. It's a very timid, overreactive dog. Any kind of stress, physical, emotional, or whatever, makes him overreact. He produces too much adrenaline, noradrenaline, corticosteroids, and so on. It makes him more vulnerable. This guy has super cool in most situations. He's very dynamic. He can flex to in inhibition to excitation. He knows when to do things. His survival is far better. This is the beginnings of the Pavlovian view towards pathophysiology, towards medicine. A very holistic view. And it's coming now in human medicine over here, where we're keeping records in hospitals now of certain diseases and certain temperament types. It's almost back to cellular somatotype of the human body where certain body types tend to match with certain resistances or susceptibilities. There's a lot of logic here, not in how the body looks, for heaven's sake, but in terms of how all the organs are tuned in relation to the autonomic nervous system and the neuroendocrine system. Next slide. I think is the last one. We should never underestimate an animal's capacity to adapt. The reason why we do tend to underestimate is that we like to set ourselves apart from animals. We did this religiously a few years ago, pre-Darwin, by saying that man was created separately from the apes. Darwin freaked everybody out by saying that we were apes. Now we're in a very different bind. We're saying that it's unscientific to be anthropomorphic. <laughs> it's another kind of religion, really. But in fact, there's a very subtle continuum between man and animal. Sure, one of our new, unique qualities is, is that we can program ourselves. We can give ourselves new beliefs, new instincts, if you like, so that we can kill each other or we can heal the world. This animal is showing something like a conversion hysteria, a paralysis in one limb. The little ring plover, that when a predator comes along the ground, like a fox, it will run off its nest in order to protect its eggs, and it will flap its wings, though it's broken. And the predator sees this and thinks, aha, that's an easy meal, and immediately follows the bird. The bird's making a hell of a noise and dragging its wing and so on. I've heard of deer, female deer doing this too, and have a fawn, pretend they have a broken leg. And then suddenly, a safe distance away from the nest, the bird flies away. It's fine. Now, how much intentionality do we put into this? That's being anthropomorphic, that the animal, the bird is pretending to do this. All ring plovers do this. It's inherited. It's innate. How can we therefore analyze this and make a comparison? The ethological analysis is to cut the bird down the middle. This half, the folded up half, wants to stay on the nest. This half wants to fly away, an ambivalent motivation. A 
it's simultaneous to combine two actions, one to stay on the nest, one to save its own feathers. And so we get this ambivalence and so on. Very fine. A conflict situation causes ambivalence. Perfect interpretation. <coughs> Quite acceptable. Let's lay this interpretation and instead of all our psych psychiatric, psychoanalytic gumph on a little boy who a few years ago had three operations on his hip for coxalgia, intractable pain. Orthopedic surgeons who, like most surgeons, used their knives before their heads, went in and explored and found nothing. So John Bowlby, director of Tavistock Clinic, has referred the case. The little boy wanted to run away from home. His parents were always fighting, couldn't keep a job. He loved his parents, he wanted to stay. So what did he do? But exactly the same. I think we can analyze behaviors in their dynamic structure to avoid anthropomorphisms and just simply look, what are we looking at? We're looking at context again. That when we look at things, we tend to look at the subject and not at the field or the ground. Seeing both subject and ground is gestalt vision. And I think we have to re-educate ourselves to this kind of perception. It's a very different way of rediscovering reality. I think this is tied in with our human awareness too. And I hope I've helped a little bit in turning you on tonight. Thank you. Dr. Fox will be glad to answer any questions if there are any questions from the floor. I'm pretty tired now and I'm sure a lot of people want to leave. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people want to go. If there are any questions. You made a comment about uh, lightning dogs. Right? Yes. Yeah. Well, nobody's probably going to check. You commented just briefly again on that point. I said that the innovation of the teeth in the carnivores, a couple of references, show that the sensitivity of the canines are like our fingertips. And so that a, presumably a carnivore has exquisite control about how much intensity to lay on. And a dog that gives a completely disinhibited bite should be severely questioned because we know that it has a capacity to control its bite. Part of this control is genetic in our soft-mouthed dogs. And I think we have to be on the lookout for dogs that go <coughs> without any inhibition whatsoever. I think these might occur in certain lines that there might be a genetic disinhibition going on. That in an innocent situation, like a little kid going up to the dog to see what's going on, and the dog turns around and really gives it one. I think we have to look there for inadequate selective breeding. Yeah. Thank you.